Hey, hey, everybody. It's so nice today. I have Nick Smart, who is going to join Naveen Gupta, who I think many of my audience are familiar with and know, uh, a former Rippler. And this is going to be a really good conversation. There's a lot of valuable information that will come because of this problem that we have in the space, which is trying to keep everybody safe. And Naveen has moved over to Crystal Intelligence. And we're going to learn a lot about what crystal intelligence does and also hopefully learn how we can uh, mitigate being one of those victims out there with people who are looking to take advantage of stealing your money or your assets. So Naveen, Nick, welcome very much. Eddie, thank you very much. And, and really a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, first of all, I'm a big fan of yours. So just want to be state, I mean, state that outright. Yeah, they, it's it's quite a pleasure for me to, after all these years, finally do this. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and I'm very happy that you took the time. And I'm quite interested to hear what your new chapter is with Crystal Intelligence. Absolutely. Nick, you want to introduce yourself, and then I'll uh, give a little bit primer, and then we can launch in. Yes, please. Sure. Uh Thanks, Naveen. Uh, hi, Ari. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Nick Smart. I'm the Director of Intelligence for Crystal. Um, my whole background uh, experience has been working in intelligence in one various form, from working for the British government through to now uh, working in cyber threat intelligence, now onto what we do for Crystal. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll pass back to Naveen. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Um, so Crystal Intelligence is a blockchain intelligence firm. And what we do is we do analytics, we do investigations, we do forensics. And really the idea is how can we keep the crypto world safe, right? So that's the fundamental reason we exist. Uh, we have been there since 2016, really working with the regulated crypto businesses, regulators, law enforcement, and supporting them in this quest of making sure crypto stays safe, safe for everybody, right? But today, what we want to speak about is that we are truly alarmed about rise of significant romance and investment scam that's happening all over the world, and specifically in Far East Asia. So if you look at Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, very significant amount of scams are happening. Of course, not all of them are related to crypto. Most of them, the recruitment of the victim happens over social media. So I think each one of your listeners probably would be getting some kind of a WhatsApp or a Twitter message to essentially connect with them. Or sometimes it's a, a good looking man or a woman trying to entice you in some way. Right. And then we see it across the board. And unfortunately, very significant number of people fall prey to that. Right. And we want to talk about that in a very open um, forum. We want to talk about the methods, the processes. And what can you do to get out of it, right? So what should we do if we are in it? And what should we do if we want to avoid them? So truly, we want to take you through our experience. And also, like, if you are if you are uh, facing something like that, uh, want to give some uh, points uh, for people to consider to implement. Brilliant. Nick, over to you. Um, would you like to share your experience? And then we kind of deep dive in with some questions with Eric. Yes. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, I have prepared some slides for today uh, just to sort of use as a rail to drink, uh, bring the discussion around. Um, and I think, you know, what I would say too is um, the cryptocurrency as a whole industry goes through like phases of narratives. And I thought, I think most people who've... Uh, been uh, around cryptocurrency for any length of time will know how it kind of pans out that, um, you know, like the first phase of narrative was cryptocurrency is a pointless endeavor. Then it was it was only used for, you know, buying and selling illicit drugs. And then it was used for this. And the more modern narrative is everything is around a fraud. Um, and as a community, we've kind of gone through iterations in this and like the, the older veterans of it will have seen that. But one of the things I will say is, is that if unless we tackle this head on, we're never going to get anywhere. We're never going to, um, you know, develop as an industry and we're not going to get any um, sort of credibility. So um, in preparation for this, I put together some statistics because there are lots of numbers that get pushed down around fraud generally. Um, in cryptocurrency particularly, there are some estimates by academics which make the numbers as high as $100 billion dollars. Uh, there are my own personal opinion. I think we're at least in the tens of billions of dollars that's lost to frauds every single year. 
Um, but looking at it as a more holistic thing, so these numbers are from 2023, uh, from the FBI, the UK National Fraud Intelligence Bureau, uh, and the Japanese National Police Agency's reports. 5.2% um, of all the US's fraud cases um, were involved romance fraud. And again, there are some things we'll talk about in a second about categorization, but there's that. However, this is compared to the UK of 6.4, half, almost half of all of Japanese reported fraud cases involve uh, romance fraud, which is a significant uh, number compared to uh, other developed economies. Uh, the total cost lost to romance fraud last year in Japan was $110 million. Um, with a much reduced number of cases compared to the US, and we'll have a look at a chart in that in a second, but that average is nearly $70,000 a case. That's almost double what it is for the US um, and at least 50% higher than what it is in the UK. So what we can say from these numbers is, is that people uh, in Japan are generally less likely to be victims of fraud. And again, that's based on reporting. But what we see is the mechanisms that are employed, romance fraud, is highly effective. Uh, and substantially, the losses are much greater. And I think there are lots of socioeconomic drivers behind that, which we could, you know, we could look at in other ways. But what it says to me is, is that it gives you an impression of how these frauds operate. Seventy thousand dollars is a lot of money to anybody, uh, and for a single case, for somebody to lose that kind of money, it's absolutely staggering to me. Um, but generally speaking, it's not $70,000 like on one, one day, right? They're not saying put $100,000 into this, put $70,000 into that, and then they run off with your money. It's done gradually over time, over extended periods. And this is why when we talk about fraud, it can be so hard, one, to convince someone that they're being a victim in the first place. And the second part is being able to get in fast enough to stop this kind of uh, situation. Um, I think the way to describe it is uh, it's a very poor, it's a very old analogy we use in the UK, but like boiling a frog. I don't know if you've heard of this before. It's a pretty grim one. But the idea is that, you know, you put the, 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 the a pan full of cold water, the frogs in it. And then as the pan gets hot, you get increasingly used to it until you don't realize what's actually going on at the end. And that's kind of how I I see these guys. Um I'll just move on to the next slide just to sort of see it as a comparison between the three uh, geographies. So you can see, uh, yeah, 1,575 um, cases in Japan uh, with an average amount of $69,000. Compare that to the UK and the US. It's almost double uh, and almost triple what the UK has. So it's a significant amount of money gets lost in fraud every single year. Um, I think, Eri, I think, like, just... This might resonate with some of your listenership. Like, uh, you know, have you? How often do you sort of come across people with in your audience who say they've been victims of fraud, or is this a story that you've come across? I get often uh, DMs. They people, of course, don't want to talk about it publicly, so they'll send me a private message and they'll let me know that you know they're then they're embarrassed, and so they just want to know at that point when they've realized what's happened to them, most of them ask me, what should they do? And is there anything they can do? And they're just, they just don't know what to do. And, and bottom line is um, they're quite embarrassed as to what happened. And they never thought, they always tell me, I never thought that I would ever be in this position. And I never thought this would happen to me. And, and, you know, I, I know better. I knew, I knew that I wasn't supposed to do this. And, and so, yeah, I get, and, and, and the occurrence in, if, as far as the rate of occurrence that that happens, it happens, uh, a DM to me at least once every one or two weeks. So that's a lot. I'm just one person out there. Um, and you can imagine many people have, uh, the same situations and I just don't hear about it. So you could take my numbers and extrapolate that and do some projections. It's a lot of people. Yeah, it really is. And I think, you know, uh, I, I talk about these statistics and I, I think what I always like to talk to is when people are well engaged with the community, you guys are often the first to hear about these problems, people asking for help. Um, but there is a different dynamic to this is that in some cases that the victims don't even know they're victims. They don't even know what's going on. They don't know it's actually happened to them at any point. They just, um, you know, have accepted that this is what's going on, and they don't look at it as the mechanism by which they were defrauded. Right? They don't realize how 
someone has betrayed their confidence to put them on a platform where they've lost money. Um, they just believe the platform's to blame and the, the, the scammers are quite effective in diverting people's attention onto those places uh, to try and, you know, redirect the victim. And, and we'll talk about their processes in a second. Um, and I think the other thing I'll say too is that many times victims don't come forward. As you said, it's a very... You know, it's a shameful act. Uh, we were discussing before we started recording today uh, a chat called James Randi. And uh, James Randi is a bit of a hero of mine, I suppose. Um, he is a fairly famous uh, American magician. Um, he was very popular through like the 70s and 80s for uh, going after like fake gurus and fake psychics. Um, and he used to, I think he was on Jimmy Carson a lot. And he used to basically get these guys to come and you know, demonstrate um, their their special abilities, and he would devise a test in which to catch them out. Uh, and I remember one distinctly, there was a chap who claimed he could move the pages of a book uh, by telekinesis, and James Randi just put a load of ping pong balls around it and said, if the guy's blowing, then you'll see the wind move the balls because he can't just move a page. And lo and behold, the guy couldn't do it. And there was a whole thing that went on for an extended period of time about him. But what I, one of the things I like about this chat particularly was he said the difference between a fraud and a magic trick. A magician will tell you to your face that he's lying. And we'll both agree with that. And we think it's fun, right? So, you know, I go to a magic show and uh, I see the guy, you know, cut his assistant in half. And, okay, I know that woman, the person who's been cut in half probably isn't really been cut in half. And I find that entertaining because we both agreed that the lie is going to take place. We have a shared ownership of that. Whereas with a fraud, I don't tell you I'm lying. And that's the big difference, right? And that's how fraud is such uh, an insidious thing is because it's it's truly plays on people's, uh, you know, um, building of relationships with each other in order to take money. And in 2024, and as we've seen over a number of years now, fraud's gone from... Um, you know, something that's been fairly, like f fairly common in some regards, but also fairly uh, underdeveloped to now a very, very targeted, tailored psychology. Uh, and we'll look at that as we we, we go through the slides. Um, so I guess the first thing then we have this sort of schematic and it's not that the process is a linear process. They could miss steps out. Uh, a colleague of mine um, and I developed this about, 12 months ago, I uh, know about two years ago, we worked together on this and we were trying to come up with a way to try and explain to people, like graphically, how does this work? Like, what does it actually look like when romance fraud does stuff? So we divide it into four key phases. And the first phase is like the romance phase, which is kind of like the capture, uh, capturing the target and uh, building the trust and everything else that comes along with that. Then there'll be the initial fraud, which is direct them onto the platform. We then have a phase, rinse and repeat, where we get you to keep putting money in. Maybe we'll even give you some uh, return on investment, right? So, oh, you sent some money. Here's a dividend from your profits. Like, we'll convince you to put more and more in. Um, and then in the end game, maybe triggered by the individual, you know, realizing or smelling something's wrong, or maybe they got tipped off by somebody. Um, they say, oh, well, no, you can't take the money out. You need to pay us a fee or... Uh, oh no, you can't take the money out. You need to, um, you know, do something for us, or the platform will just go dead, um, and then they'll just cease communication. And this is what we did about 12, 18 months ago. There are modifications to this, uh, and there's usually a phase now uh, beyond uh, can't withdraw, and that can either be a recovery fraud, which is, oh, by the way, you know, my name's. Um, you know, X, Y, Z, I can do a recovery for you. I, I've got these lawyers, they can go and get the money back and sue this platform, just give us some money and victims will be compelled to do that. In other cases, um, the contact phase, right? So the relationship building, because it's based around romance, right? And, you know, people are very connected in the world now, but people still feel lonely. And, you know, people want to have someone to share their time with. Um, and because the scammers know this, they they form a, you know, a one ended romantic relationship and the individuals who are genuinely in love with the people who are defrauding them, they'll believe anything they say. And if the person who does that turns around and says, hey, they scam me too, let's go on this platform and make our money back, they'll divert their attention to somewhere else. And the whole point of this process is to extract the maximum amount of money from the target, the maximum amount of money from the victim. And when you sort of see it as like a schematic like this, 
it looks quite simple. Like, oh, I could definitely you know, detect the initial contact. Someone's going to get in touch with me on a dating application and suddenly they're going to switch the conversation onto, you know, come and invest in this MetaTrader 5 based platform or come and invest in this uh, this brokerage firm like they're doing amazing. Um, they don't even do lies anymore like unrealistic APRs. They know that the messaging from um, the authorities is, okay, if you see something that says you can get a 10,000 you know, APY return on a token or an exchange, like it's probably too good to be true. They're a bit more adjusted now, like, oh, we'll do 10% or they'll do 12%, right? They'll look for something that sounds credible just to take the money from you. And again, this is this is the reality of this. They've perfected not just the initial contact psychology is in how to make you build trust with them, uh, but they also have perfected what looks plausible as a website, what looks plausible as a scheme, what looks plausible as, you know, why it went wrong and how to perpetuate you as a victim. And what our goal is as crystal intelligence is we can't do anything about the initial contact as a blockchain intelligence company. It's not possible for us to do that. We can talk and educate people here now. And we also don't want a situation where everyone thinks everyone else is a scammer. That's an awful situation. You know, people need to be able to have functioning uh, relationships. Um, but what we do need to do is we need to detect, detect the fraud platforms better and detect the money that's being cashed out later on. And that's what we do at Crystal. We really look for, um, you know, the the websites and the addresses associated with those, but also the middle guys, right? The payment processors. Um, what does it actually look like on chain though? Because I think that's the other thing that people ask me is, well, you know, okay, great. You've got this schematic. Like we can actually validate this process on chain. Uh, here we can see a website called Sundell. Um, it's a fairly uh, well-known one. I think Sundell FX is a pretty well-known one. Um, we can see people depositing money um, to that website, to a variety of things. There's a significant amount of money there last year. Look, 105 Ethereum. Uh, and then we can see the money uh, getting sent onto the launderers in significant amounts and a payout uh, to a victim in one case. So we saw a withdrawal from Sundell directly to someone's uh, personal uh, deposit wallet at a cryptocurrency exchange. That's not the scammers laundering directly on exchanges. It's more likely to be them paying a dividend to a victim uh, to convince them to put more in. And this is what we see time, time, time again. Um, now, can you, as a private individual, detect this kind of behavior? Like, if you were looking at an address, could you perhaps look for this kind of stuff? Maybe, yeah. But generally speaking, you, you know, augmenting with tools to get an idea of what the address is about and what's going on with it will make a big difference um, in your ability to detect this. Um, we do have a problem, though, for us as a company and that's because as i said before it's it's an industrial fraud um and a big thing i remember when we started looking at this stuff before is when everyone says fraud the traditional fraud that people talk about in the internet age are the email scams right the guys who'll be say i'm by the way i'm a you know a west african prince um my money's been seized by the United Nations, I just need to pay a $100,000 release fee and then they'll give me $50 billion. Uh, just reply to my email and send me uh, some money to this bank account or whatever else. That's not the case. And like, I think the other issue too is it's kind of lighthearted. Like I remember like people make jokes about it still to this day, you know, about being a West African prince, like when they get something that's perhaps too good to be true or trying to describe something. But the reality now is that it's not like one guy mass email campaign. It's tens of thousands of people operating at a very sophisticated level um, whose sole purpose is this. And they have dedicated technical teams. They have dedicated managers. They have quotas and targets, just as you'd expect in any sales organization. They're massive. Um, and for us as a company, it's hard to keep up with the volume of websites that they create. And I think it's the same problem too for internet service providers and authorities. So rather than just look at like one site, so Sundell's domain, as you can see here, we're actually looking at many hundreds of domains. Uh, this is some research that I did, and we found 558 results of websites that looked almost the same as Sundell's one. So let's just take that data point as valid, but 558 websites all operating the same fraud. And that's just one set of websites. There are hundreds of thousands of these websites out there. From a company, our, our perspective, there is a huge challenge for us to try and gather all of that data. And we see it in many cases now where 
we find addresses associated with one fraud website, but we look back on chain and we find multiple other uh, websites associated with those domains, like multiple other ones. And we know there are other addresses that we don't have collection on, but we know they're almost certainly associated with fraud too because of the sheer scale of it. So what that means is, again, this is just an example of all the related screenshots. You'll notice too, there are different languages on here. You can think, I see Thai, there's Japanese in the bottom right-hand corner. And again, they tailor it to their targets. They know what works with you. Uh, there's Chinese uh, in the top center too. So what you're getting to now is a point where the fraud is almost tailored to the individual. They, uh, and I'll talk about the, the, the operators of this fraud at the moment. Um, the typical view of them is, you know, it's like four or five people in a room with maybe some laptops and some mobile phones somewhere in, you know, uh, you know, some remote region doing this kind of stuff. The reality is it's tens of thousands of people in compounds. They get reading packs. They have particular teams assigned to particular countries. They have specific points. They keep up with the news. They make sure they're aware of the crypto news. They know everything that's going on around the environment. So when they talk, they're credible, right? It doesn't sound like it's come from someone who doesn't understand what they're talking about. They're credible to you. And all of this is designed to maximize that social and psychological lever to sort of convince you to, to invest money. So even to the point where they'll talk about like, uh, you know, national stereotypes as a way to try and understand the psychological drivers behind you so for example british they'll know full well that you know being british uh english there's a good chance that i'll support a football team or a soccer team uh if you are you know uh, geographically challenged um when it comes to that okay, where are you from well they say okay i'm from birmingham okay so there's a good chance that he supports birmingham city but he's not an idiot so he supports aston villa and they'll go to that sort of level of things to try and develop those kind of subjects. And we all have that. Um, even in the US, they'll look at particular states, they'll talk about things that might be relevant to where you're from. Uh, if you're from particular countries, they'll know particular foods or things. They are fully aware. And again, you have to say in some ways, you, you have to be impressed that a sales organization, in fact, how it operates as a sales organization, they have so much data available, and they've really levered it to, to try and create this thing. But the reality is, I'll go back to that magic trick. They're not doing anything in our interest. They're lying to you to steal your money. And I, I, I really hate the anxiety and the paranoia that can create in people uh, around this space because, again, it's it's damaging to all of us. But that point is it's industrial. It, it's not an individual sort of uh, relationship. Yeah. And Nick, one example we have seen, for example, is somebody acting as a potential tenant. So let's assume person A is a landlord and they'll act as a tenant and then get all the information on that person. And the reverse as well. Sometimes they will act as a landlord and potential tenants apply, right? So then, of course, on the behalf of screening the tenants, who are you, how many kids, you have pets, and things like those. And they keep that information. And of course, they are. this is a fake landlord. And then for those hundreds of those potential victims, then at the right time, they just drop in. But they know so much about you that it's easy for them to use the right trigger to essentially then bring you. So they know if you are a if you're widowed or not, or X, Y, Z, right? So they totally understand both your financial and the mental state. And then at the right point, they will strike. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really key one as well. Like they really understand your mental state and they look for vulnerable people. So I think, you know, uh, they look for lonely people. They understand what they're doing. So they go to dating apps and websites. They create fake profiles. They do these sort of things. Uh, and they target you from that. Uh, another one that we've seen as well is... Um, it's a modern fact of uh, life, unfortunately, that, you know, there's always going to be a data breach. I think you can assume as soon as your information is on someone, some company's servers, um, it may be stolen at some point, you know, and there are hundreds and hundreds of these sort of cases. Um, so your phone number's out there somewhere. You'll get a text message, a WhatsApp line, signal, whatever it is. Hey, um, ha have you... Um, uh, this is my new phone number. How are you? Or something like that. And they'll strike up a conversation, you know, it's cold calling. It, it, it's effective. And again, like it might not be effective for, for like me. Do you know what I mean? Like I might be resistant to that particular tactic. But, you know, if someone's, you know, has a fairly solitary life or, you know, is, is feeling a bit uh, lonely, maybe they've just been had a bereavement with a partner or maybe they've been on their own for a long time. These are really easy hooks to pull into people. Um, and I think it's very sad. 
um, that these are the people they target. And they also have real consequences. Um, I have been working for quite a long time on these cases. We've supported a number of uh, journalist organizations, um, you know, not publicly because of uh, some of the stuff that we've discovered. Um, but some of the things that we've discovered have been pretty big. Uh, and one of the, the sadder parts of this is there are real human costs. People have taken their lives from being in debt. Uh, one gentleman who invested, an uh, American chap, who invested in one of these frauds uh, to many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think it was o over a few million, in fact. Um, he borrowed money from friends and family to invest. He had taken out multiple loans. He'd started getting himself into all sorts of situ a terrible situation. Uh, and he took his own life. Like, And it's not an isolated case. There are a number of cases where this happens. So for me, the imperative is like, this is... I do think it's a national emergency, and I think that's why we're seeing a lot more, you know, law enforcement agencies and regulators take it seriously. Um, whereas perhaps fraud wasn't seen that way before, but it does have a real consequence to to, to people in our societies, and not just to you know the leading to of life, but also the breakdown in trust between individuals. Now we are uh, now questioning each other's motives all the time, which is also the other insidious part of this. Um. I think we talked a bit about the victims who've lost money. I think there's another side of victims here too. Um, so I mentioned that this is organized. Um, we, um, as a as a team, we see a lot of the other side too. So uh, there are some compounds which are operated out of Southeast Asia, particularly uh, amongst other locations, um, that basically lure people over with opportunities for like, customer service positions or IT support workers, or in some cases like hospitality. Uh, and what really happens is, is they arrive in one particular place. They're then loaded on a bus, driven somewhere else, uh, and then locked in one of these compounds, given a script and said, right, you're going to go and do this, or you're going to work for us. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences. And the consequences are dire. Um, the consequences uh, may involve, you know, uh, some pretty inhumane treatment beatings, uh, rape, torture. Um, on the right, you can see uh, a set of instructions from one of the compounds. Uh, it was an isolation room, which was half submerged in water, where people who tried to escape or had tried to report their conditions to the outside world, um, this is how they'd have been kept. They'd have been handcuffed with their hands above their head, uh, standing, in a bottle, uh, standing in water uh, for several hours or days at a time uh, in order to sort of coerce them to not try and escape again. Um, when we talk about frauds, we tend to focus a lot on the individual victims, but also there's another side to this, which is uh, perhaps uh, equally as bad, if not worse, which is the human disaster on the other side. Uh, we work a lot with some uh, organizations that try to tackle this problem. Uh, another thing might happen is when the people try to escape, uh, as in like they want to leave, uh, they're obviously held against their will. Um, they'll ransom their families. So what we'll find now is that the the people who work in these compounds are generally from less wealthy uh, countries or less wealthy backgrounds. They've gone there for opportunities. They offer fairly attractive salaries, uh, as you can see on that slide to the left. And these are real job adverts, by the way. These are we've taken these from uh, various uh, uh, groups that we've sort of managed to get some data on. But you can see they offer attractive salaries. Um, the people go over there to work in these compounds. Uh, they want to leave and then their families are ransomed. And it can range for like ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to have one of their family members released. Um, and for some of these guys, if they're like rural farmers from, you know, the Philippines or from, you know, North Africa or someone like that, that can be a huge amount of money to them, an absolutely huge amount of money. Um, so I think what we need to do really is we we, we need to look forward as a as a as an industry on how we can address this problem and, and, and how we can, um, you know, get in front of these criminals. And I think when we've talked about fraud in the past, there's like lots of it's like personal defense measures, right? It's like, we're trying to block ourselves from being the victim of this scam. We're trying to avoid those websites or whatever else. The other part of this too is, okay, if you are a victim, don't be quiet about it. Help these people um, by reporting it to the authorities by collecting all the data, by trying to gather that information. Because 
okay, justice is slow, but uh, an unstoppable object, right? Like it's like that mm-hmm. boulder from Indiana Jones. It just, it just, it's, it's not might not be that fast, but it's going to get there eventually. And I think um, for this is the more we collect, you know, if you are approached by a scammer, uh, if you are approached one of these job adverts, for example, and they don't just look at like, for example, um, you know, like migrant laborers, they look also for technical people. We've heard stories about like fairly competent engineers with AI being recruited to these compounds and forced to create software to enhance their activities. Obviously, maintaining hundreds of thousands of websites is, you know, is, is a technical task. Like you can't just do that with, you know, Stack Overflow and ChatGPT. You, you need to know how to do these things. So it's important for us as a community and to sort of like fight back against these guys. And I think, you know, we as a, a crystal are very much keen to be as far in the front of that as as, as physically possible. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. Like it's it's very sad actually. I like I, sometimes I like to talk about happy stuff in cryptocurrency. You know, talk about opportunities and like how it's changing and everything else and how it's helping the world. But we have to tackle these problems. Uh, we really, really do. And I think it's dreadfully sad uh, that you know we need, ever need to have these conversations. There are always going to be scammers. There are always going to be grifters. But when you see the catastrophe that is unfolding because of these guys um it's 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 dreadful it's utterly utterly dreadful and again like uh, to to give you a scale of like the strategic issue so there have been extensive crackdowns by law enforcement internationally about this problem we saw uh some people getting put on sanctions lists at least by the uk we've seen uh lots of raids and activity against this um kind of behavior in some south uh, uh southeast asian places like they've been raised in the philippines against these kind of places too like there there's lots and lots and lots of effort to try and counter and tackle this stuff so like the light is there at the end of the tunnel but i feel like for us as a community right as like the guys who've been in crypto for a long period of time or the guys who you know um who have some technical skills or something else like this is where you can make a difference right you can go in there and say do you know what like I kind of look at it like, I don't want you in my neighborhood. That's how I look at it, right? I don't want these guys living around me. I don't want these guys making trouble, causing crime. And I'm not advocating for, like, vigilantism. Like, you don't need to go and start, you know, trying to go to these compounds yourself on a plane and end up getting yourself injured or killed. Like, no, not at all. But you as an individual can actually make quite a big difference. You can report fraud websites. You can report blocked uh, record, uh, report to the platform operators accounts that are trying to operate scams. Let's give them a really hard place to live and like try and suck the oxygen out of them. Uh, but on our side, from a blockchain analytics company, like what do we do? Like we're in the middle of this the whole time. And obviously, you know, amongst our clients, we count law enforcement and private investigators, lawyers, uh, and also cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, like our role in this isn't just to like target the front end, like you as a community, like, you know, everyone who listens to this podcast today, if you ever get a, um, message from someone who you think is going for a scam, like don't keep them on the hook. Don't try and like, you know, be clever and, you know, bait them into revealing loads of details or collect IP addresses or anything like that at all. There's no need to just report the address, report the address, report the website they're going to do, try and get their account closed. It doesn't take too much time and it makes a big dent out of it. And if we all work on this principle, if we all organize in this direction, it just makes the scammer's life a little bit harder. Maybe it shuts down one account here that's working on someone else right now. Maybe it closes a few. Um, For social media companies, it's a relentless task to keep bots and these fraudsters out of their platforms. Like it's a relentless task and it's always going to be more difficult. It's only got more difficult with you know, the advent of AI and other things like that. And the same for like phone operator companies and ISPs. It's it's just, it's not and impossible. Like I said, 500 websites, that's for one brand. And how many brands are we looking at? Maybe hundreds of thousands of different websites. They're going to have to try and shut down and they do it every single day. But you as an individual, you, you, you can do this. It's, you know, I, I feel it's like civic duty, right? You know, it's like you see some things going wrong. That guy's beating up that guy at the side of the street. You know, they're about to kill each other. I'm not saying go and run in between the two of them and push them apart, but call the police. Do you know what I mean? Or maybe, you know, if that uh if that uh building's on fire and there's like a you know a barrel of like I don't know, like petrol outside of it, and you've got the facility to move it out of the way, you you do it, right? Everyone will do that as a cell. So I think it's a civic duty that we report frauds 
on whatever platform. So we report them when they come to us on the social media platforms and we report the websites when we find them. We can all make a dent in this as individuals. But us as a company, we're focused on a different side, right? So we have these two sets of victims. We have the people who've lost money and the people who've been, uh, you know, effectively lost their lives maybe or lost their freedom. So what do we do as a company? We, we focus on the big guys in the middle. I'm interested in finding the payment processes. I'm fi- interested in finding... Uh, where the money goes to and working with law enforcement and exchanges to take that off because, you know, we can try and tackle the front end and that's what, you know, I implore like the average listener to do. But on the other side, we want to dis- we want to dismantle these guys completely. And if we can take away the gains from this, if we can take away the money that they're making and give it back to people, right? If I can take all the money that's been stolen from one particular scam or one particular compound and I can return it to its victims, or we can send the guy who's responsible for this to jail, like that's a result for me. And we work really hard to try and identify those processes. But again, that's what we do at a higher level. You as an individual, you can have a really big impact on, on that lower level. So who are we as a company? I guess we have our three sort of main functions. We do the intelligence, which is what we're talking about today, which is our software as a service platform, which you can use to monitor transactions and investigate what's going on. Uh, we also have a dedicated investigations team who are highly, highly effective. Um, we have had, we have supported a number of fairly high profile cases um, and really complicated ones too, with a fair degree of success. Uh, again, we don't talk about who that specifically, but we are fairly successful as investigators. And even then, you know, if there's a case, we can at least give you some idea of where it's gone. Uh, and the final thing we do is training and support. So it's not about, oh, look at the Crystal guys. They're so clever. Look at all the stuff that they've done and look at all the tools they've made. No, we want to try and provide practical training sessions um, so you can investigate. So if you're a private investigator or you're a law enforcement official, or if you're a lawyer and you've got cases that involve cryptocurrency and you want to understand what's going on, like we can give you some training and support and understanding what's really going on. And I'll say too, as we come from a position of, expertise but also at the same time a position of humility we don't know everything it's not possible to and we try to give you the tools to go and understand certain things better so crypto is constantly changing there's always new things on the blockchain they're all using new tokens and new protocols new services every single week is new one we can't keep up with that like it's not possible to keep up with all of that all the time what we do is try and teach you as an investigator the practical tools that you need So if you do have to specialize in one particular thing, you can go and do it and you understand what people are saying to you or understand what the protocol is talking about. It's not about giving you a full solution and suddenly you walk away and you're Superman or Batman or whatever else. Like you can you can do enough of the job yourself. Um, The final thing I think and I'll hand it back to Naveen is I'll just talk about our data principles as, as, as a team. Uh, we have three rules for Crystal's data, right? So the first thing we have to do is be useful. Um, the data needs to be usable to do something with it. So you need to be able to know this is the exchange that my money was sent to. Okay, that means that we can do something with that data. The second part is to be fast. We try to react very quickly to hacks or frauds as they are detected. We are aimed to label those addresses within a very narrow period of time because that we tend to find that maximizes the chances of funds being frozen uh, and ultimately a successful outcome for the victim, be that the return of the funds, that which might take longer. Uh, and the final thing is to be reliable. So every data point that we have in our tool is, is backed up by some form of evidence. It's not uh, you know, based on our gut instincts or other things like that. There is some data backing up and supporting what we said. So when we attribute something and say, hey, this address belongs to Binance, there is a reason why we've done that and we have a way to prove uh, what, why we got to, to that point. Uh, Naveen, I guess I'll, uh, I'll I'll let you talk about the fight back a bit more. Yeah, absolutely, right, Ari? And I think this is the place where listeners will be more interested. And some of these things Nick has already covered in terms of uh, speaking with someone. But I wanted to talk about the community aspect of crypto. So crypto started as a community, right? I mean, it's very powerful. The community is integrated with each other and they truly care about each other, right? So that means there are people out there who care about your story, what you are going through. So speak to someone, speak to someone in the community that you know. Um, and we have seen very, very highly educated people fall for this. Speak to your family. I mean, so people know that they are not alone. Report, right? Uh, if you're uncomfortable to report, report to somebody in the community who can then report on your behalf. If for some reason there is a technical challenge, 
and in terms of submitting that on a website of the police uh, somebody else can do it on your behalf there is no problem at all right because the community itself is very very strong and people have known each other for many many years being in the uh, crypto world right even the community can be if something seems to be too good to be true check back with others put that on the community discord channel or the whatsapp channel whatever you're using and saying hey does this sound legit does this sound right to you and behold there will be 10 people who will jump in hey don't fall prey to this i fell for this or i investigated or i found out or i saw this happening in xyz country right so i think this community aspect which is very natural to crypto can be used as a positive force right and on the community side the last thing that i would say is we truly want to want to support advocacy groups and ngos right and and i use the word ngo loosely there could be a bunch of people in the community who could essentially be vigilantes or who could essentially say hey yeah you know what we would take on the responsibility of keeping the community safe and this could be uh, bitcoin community ethereum polygon what have you or this could be people who are from across the community we want to train them so we'll offer free trainings to you you can use a tool for free to then dig in to say hey there is something that has been reported by a victim within our community how do we go out and help them right so we we truly want to keep everybody safe and let's use this community aspect of crypto towards positive as a positive force right and i know a lot of time we talk about investment to say hey is the price going up and down i think more and more we need to have a more balanced discussion around things that are going wrong as as well outside of purely price and and of course the product uh, roadmap that a particular coin has right so and i think that will really help they'll keep everybody safe and also there will be this sense of togetherness and caring which already exists but this is the way we can show it yeah the yeah, power absolutely. of the community is probably a a great tool to help fight back uh, absolutely i think they said uh, a few times like it takes a network to beat a network as we said right early on right these guys are huge right they're big networks of people who run this stuff um you know connections to serious organized criminal groups and everything else as you both know like crypto is one of the most vibrant networks there is everyone's I mean, like, you know, everyone has like these things about crypto Twitter and or crypto X as it is now, I suppose, like, and it's kind of like it's adversarial sort of community sort of stuff. But I think the reality is when the community is threatened, it tends to, it, it, it kind of has its own antibodies, right? And I think this is what, you know, we want to advocate for is if you work for an advocacy group, if you work for a victim support organization, come speak to us, we can help you. Uh, and we'd love to do that. And crypto has that power, right? We have that big group of people who can, Again, make it a hostile place for them. Make it difficult for these guys to operate. Do you know what I mean? Make it harder for them to 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 use our technology and our uh, our media to sort of enrich themselves and 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 punish others. Um, I think just on that, we did have like a few points uh, specifically for it. So there are three sort of main things that we talk about: is educating, detecting, and reporting. And Naveen, I think you wanted to say as well about the breaking the stigma part as well. Yeah, I think the key part is also. i mean i i mean we we believe and we know that lots of crime doesn't get reported and primarily because of stigma right like to essentially say hey if i tell i have been fallen prey to the love scam would the police person laugh at me would my family laugh at me right i mean what would my friends think of me right and that's the stigma that we need to break because believe me all of us are susceptible to this right nobody is immune and hence talking about it openly is important talking about to your close friends and to the people whom you feel comfortable with in the community is important and also it's important for the listener to be empathetic right and to help rather than uh, make fun right and i think i think that's quite critical and this way we'll be able to save lives we'll be able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, money that is going to fraudsters and also we'll be able to detect fraud a lot a lot more earlier mm. I think too as well like uh phrasing is really important around this as well um and again we were talking about it before the we started recording but um many people will describe uh what we just what we call romance fraud um as pig butchering like that's the common vernacular for it um I have a real problem with that term not because like I have a a, a thing that I worry about you know pigs being slaughtered or anything else I don't like the idea of comparing somebody who's been psychologically manipulated by vindictive uh, and predatory fraudsters being referred to as a pig like we're not going to get more reports and we're not going to tackle this problem if we put labels on people who've been victimized right you know um 
I mean, I, I could go a step further and say the word scam sometimes makes it too soft, right? We 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 use the word scam and it sounds a bit sort of, you know, it's 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 less threatening than fraud, right? Fraud is a word of the law. Scam is kind of like a slang word. I, I think it's really important that when we talk about this stuff is um, we're, we're compassionate towards those people who've been affected. And I would implore anybody who works in any kind of messaging around this stuff. So if you do operate an exchange, let's say, or you do whatever else and you do some awareness around this, rethink carefully about your branding around this. Rethink carefully how you describe it. You, We want those reports. You want those reports because it helps you know, Im improve the reputation of your platform or your business. Let's make sure that we're using compassionate and caring words to describe what's happened to people. At the end of the day, they didn't get into these scams because um, you know, they... That they for any of the reasons that anyone else does, like they wanted to make some money. And I don't think that's a problem. Like, you know, I think we all at the end of the day want to make money. Um, it's not fair to then call them, you know, pigs or idiots or stupid or whatever else. Let's lift that. And then let's make sure that this reports come in because, you know, it's, it's very critical that this data gets collected as it's collected. We have more cases to build. And again, like, look at this way is this, fraud is multinational right like it operates from every single country in the world like and it's not just like people stealing money like robin hood from you know poorer southeast asian countries from like wealthier western or east asian economies it's not they don't care who they steal money from they will steal from literally everybody they want um like they'll do it to all of you um we have to understand as that that okay maybe the report that you raise in your country doesn't solve your that case in your country but maybe it's a data point in you know a different jurisdiction who will do something about it so for example let's say i'm a victim of fraud in the uk and the case that i report to the uk police uh doesn't go anywhere but the report i've also submitted to you know crystal uh get picks up on a radar of someone in spain for example and the spanish prosecutor feels like it have a case we can start prosecuting these guys we can start building a much bigger process and again that's the power of the network right we're international we're multi-ethnicity we're multicultural. as a group of people in cryptocurrency we have this common focus we all get together okay the case is not going to work in one jurisdiction someone else will pick it up and we'll make these guys live hell that's my goal is to move these guys out of our space entirely and literally you know make it a hostile place for them to come so when they come at us when they do send out these messages or whatever else someone's reporting it straight away they're getting shut down and all these things happen and similarly to if you have been a victim of fraud like you will feel shamed right and again i go back to that idea of the magic trick you laugh at the end of a magic trick like you think it's funny because what's happened is not true you know it's not true but like we've agreed that and it's similar like, it's like some comedy too right we know it's a joke like we know it's we're in that shared kind of like thing we all agree that this is not going to be correct but at the same time it's okay the difference here is afterwards you feel shame there's that denial phase there's lots of complicated psychological feelings that will happen after you have that lifted most of the time people deny it most of the time people will say no no it wasn't wasn't a fraud it was genuine like they were a real person to me like it's important that if you know people who are in those positions that you support them talk to each other are you all right like, how's it going don't feel ashamed about it the shameful part i think would be um to think that you are in, uh, stupid because you're not these guys are clever like they're really 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 clever and i hope that throughout the course of like this you know past 25 30 minutes that we've discussed it you can see just how clever they really are and Again, I think it's one thing to be beaten by a stupid opponent. You're not playing against guys who have a poor command of the language which they speak, uh, and like you should be able to spot like the spelling mistakes in an email. And uh, how could you be so stupid to think that you know you would get money from this wild story? We're so far past that now, so far past that that it isn't a shame. It isn't a shameful thing to do. It's incredibly upsetting. And it can have huge and disastrous financial consequences for the individuals. But the the shame of being uh, being tricked should not last because these guys are very, very skilled in what they do. You know, you're, you're not playing against amateurs. These guys are professional. That's um, correct. That's yeah. correct. Absolutely. So report, like we said, um, advocacy groups, talk to the community. And I mean, we are there to help. We are there to help as much as possible. And so is the community. We are there for you. 
this is great. I was going to ask if there was a dedicated email, and I see that there is a dedicated email. And I I know that the people that do contact me every so often, every month, um, yeah, I don't think they probably report it. They just needed someone to talk to. And so I, I think that they are just sharing their story in hopes that it makes them feel better. Um, some sort of, you know, they're, they're going through a, I think a, a psychological period where they're trying to make sense of what they just did. And so um, I, I'm, I'm really thankful now that I can give them this uh, email address to, to uh, report it so that there is an official report made. And then like Nick had mentioned that all of those reports could end up in a, a, a database that actually uh, results in, in catching these guys at, or at least at the very least shutting down enough that it makes it difficult and they, they want to leave this space. Cause if we make it easy for them to operate in this space, it's, it'll only get worse instead of better. So this is great. That was my, my one question was the dedicated email. And then I also know, and Naveen, you're probably aware that there are some pretty good sleuths in this space. And I think that maybe they're underutilized. <laughs> and so I, I'm very thankful to know that you're concentrating on these efforts because I, I think with that talent in the space and in particular because of, of what um the XRP community went through in particular, they did hone their skills and there are some very good sleuths in this space. Um, so it's wonderful to know that maybe they can utilize that talent that they have developed and, and assist also in a, in a next level sort of way. So that's, that's really fantastic. And I'm, I'm thankful that now we have that information but it was incredibly informative. I am a little bit taken aback. I'm I'm a little shocked. It feels uh, the information feels heavy on my shoulders, and and I think that that I too, along with people who are in positions like myself who have an audience, we do get those questions a lot in DMs. In our uh, particularly, I know you said that tele Telegram has some people working that social media, but I tend to get a lot of the um, the engagement uh, coming from DMs on X. So maybe, yeah, this is, um, this is a, a message to the people who are in a similar position as I am um, to maybe we should work together as a community to figure out some good ways to slow this down as well. I, I, I add to actually uh, just on the direction of communications in it. Um, if you obviously for yourself, Eri, but also for anybody else who might have uh, been a victim of fraud, there are victim support organisations out there. Uh, like Crystal's not a victim support organisation. Obviously, we we make tools and we collect data to try and empower the law enforcement response to this, and even the, some victim advocacy groups. We try and help them. If you're struggling, like if you've had this thing and you don't know who to talk to, like there are people who are on their uh, organizations who will give you either signpost you to local contacts, groups who you can talk to, people to get help. And again, I think the, the, the big part of this is like, don't think you're alone. I think that's the other part too, is like, if you've been robbed like this, don't think you're alone. I, I get messages on my LinkedIn quite frequently as well from people reporting stuff. And I guide them to, okay, look, I can't help you with your case you know what i mean like it's it, it's not something I, I can do like we can look at what's happened on, on chain but and you know you need to go to the police or you need to uh you know we at least take this as a report you still need to go to your law enforcement agencies um but for the social the mental side like to sort of keep you sane and to sort of help you recover for what's happened there are support groups out there and um there are some excellent resources that they have uh, either to help advise you on what to do next on who to speak to how to speak to law enforcement to um, and strongly, I would say is that, you know, if something happens, by all means, press report um, on our website, we have a 
uh, we have an explorer called Crystal Light, uh, a free block explorer that you can use, which is it's, it's only on the Bitcoin blockchain at the moment. But uh, you can go on there and you can actually file a report about what's happened on a particular address and uh, for any chain, not just Bitcoin. Uh, and we'll get that and it'll add to our attribution and help uh, our law enforcement partners. But it doesn't stop there, right? Oh, you've done your part. I've reported the address. I can move on with my life. You, you can also go and get help from... Uh, local support organizations who will give you advice on how to react and you know, how to have the conversations maybe with your bank or maybe with a cryptocurrency exchange or how to find someone, how to speak to law enforcement about your cases. Um, again, it, it's a really, really big part. So the way in which we beat these guys, as I said, and I think we all agree is like we use a network against them. We, 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 we cause them as much problems as possible. Let's make it an uncomfortable place for them to operate. Let's, let's make it absolute thing. And it's not about publicly calling them out or sticking it all over, you know, social media to sort of like, you know, broadcast to the world what's happened. Quietly build up a database against them. Quietly build up cases against them. So when something happens, like, like when someone can do something about it, we get all of it and we get every, we nail them for everything that we can. And I think that's the really big um, takeaway I've always had. Harry, first of all, big thank you to you. And I think at the end, what we want to say really to your listeners is, yes, there is some bad forces out there who would like to hoodwink you off your money, but also just crypto itself is a very positive field. We have the strength of community behind us. Uh, please, please talk to people, report the people. And they're, they're a very small number of people who are doing bad things. And together we can make it a safe place. We can make it a vibrant place where we all can thrive. A crypto will be industry that will be there for a long time and it'll create both um, jobs, it'll create financial inclusion, it'll create wealth for everybody. Let's just make sure that small irritant that is there in terms of these scams and frauds get weeded out. So let's help to make the industry grow. Thank you very much. Yeah, great message. Thank you very much for coming on. Nick, did you want to have any closing comments? Yeah, I think uh, first of all, I'll say thank you very much for having us on today. And I'm sorry we couldn't talk about something a little bit more exciting or a bit less heavy. Um, I think if I say anything, like whenever I've heard about these cases in the past, it makes me very angry, like very, very, very angry. And I feel like, you know, there are two ways to look at this. One of them is like it's bleak and depressing. The other part is, is the hope that we have forward, which is, as Naveen said, we have the co we have the community. We have a group of people who are so vibrant and wanting to talk to each other and relay what their findings are and oh have you seen this or are building that and like all these people who are creating stuff for the world and the benefit of society and like there is definitely a light at the end of this tunnel because you know you, the people who are uh, building and creating and working tirelessly to enhance and you know not just to steal from people like they really are the answer to this problem, right? And like, we like to count ourselves amongst that solution too, right, as a tool provider. But the other good thing about crypto is it's very um, social and there are lots of people who, you know, who can do really good things here. There are some really smart, intelligent people out there who can help. So the bleakness of what we've discussed in this podcast is hugely overshadowed by just the sheer skill and stubbornness of people in this environment to leave problems unsolved like crypto came about because we had a problem right there was a problem with the way payments were done there were problems with the way like money was done people weren't happy about it and that's what we all go back to right we felt there was a better way to do things i i we've solved every problem so far this is another bump in the road we will solve this problem and it is through the sheer will of people in the community but you know, crystal we're part of this solution but we're only like this much we we need all of crypto's community to turn around and say right sick of these guys i'm fed up with the narratives being labeled with us everything's a scam everything's a fraud everything's this right enough of this let's fix it we've done it time and time and time again this is just the next challenge for us to, to, to hurdle and we'll do it i know we will 100 percent. and eric big thank you to give us the opportunity to to speak about this right and and again even in the future eric if you think that there is a um, there is a topic that our firm could join either a panel of experts or something that we could investigate, find out, do some research and come back to you. We'll be more, we'll be more than happy. Our strength as a firm is behind people like yourself. So a big thank you to you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and I look forward to catching up with you and, and I've got some ideas and 
want to thank you so much for today's information and I'll do the very best I can to make that heard across as as far and wide as I can do. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.